Tommy. I'm Eddie and we're the Skid Guys. Yeah, we want to give a shout out to Family of Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you for going to see Family Camp. We hope that you enjoy this movie. We hope it brings lots of laughter, love, and it points you to God all at the same time. We get to be in the movies as a family and congregation and laugh a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be great. Oh boy, we also have to give a shout out to uh, Noah Bauer. Oh yeah. Noah, hey, oh, yeah. uh, and Camp Omega. Thank um, you. We hear that uh, Noah is having a camp at Camp, uh, a family camp at Camp Omega, yeah. July 22nd to the 24th. Oh my goodness, that is so fantastic. You're gonna see something in family camp. You're gonna see the value of family camp, of what it means to take your family there. Some people go reluctantly, some people are excited to go. It doesn't matter why they go. God is just glad they're there. So we know families are gonna be affected by this movie and by going to an actual family camp. All right, we'll see you at the movies. See you at the movies. And hopefully Noah will see you at summer camp. Yes. Well, good morning and welcome to worship. Today we're going to be in week two of our four-week sermon series called Kick the Bucket, at which we address the questions of what happens when we die. So we begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For our confession this morning, I'd like you to consider this. Fear is a powerful emotion that affects us all. Sometimes fear is a good thing that protects us from harm. But other times, fear gets in the way of our trusting in the Lord. Unfounded fears that we dream up in our head often keep us from sharing our faith and living out our faith with others. So for those times when we let fear overcome our trust in the Lord, let's confess those and all other sins to our merciful Father. Well, friends, I have great news for you this morning. Our Heavenly Father has heard your confession and he promises in his word that when we confess our sins, that he's faithful to forgive us. So by the authority of God's word, it's my privilege to announce to you this morning the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our New Testament reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are, they are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday become like the heavenly man. Here ends our New Testament reading. Our Gospel reading from this morning is from Luke chapter 23 and on. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. One of the criminals who was hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said since you are under the same sentence? 
We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Here ends our gospel reading. Please join me now in the profession of our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. Well, today in week two of our four-week Kick the Bucket sermon series, we're going to look at what it means to rest in peace. Now, what comes to mind for me when I hear rest in peace is this. You've maybe seen something like this. Reminds me of the old Western movies when you'd see the tombstone in the Boot Hill Cemetery out on the edge of town, and all it said was, R.I.P., rest in peace. But you know, while I was looking for this picture to use in the message today, I found a few more creative tombstones that I want to share with you this morning. First, this one. How about that? Anita Shovel. That's pretty good, isn't it? How about this next one? My Remains. That's another pretty good one, right? Very creative. But how about Or what do you think of this one here? This one really struck my funny bone. Died from not forwarding that text message to 10 people. That's kind of current today, right? But this next one is my favorite. Still alive. It's my favorite because it most closely represents resting in peace, which again is what we're going to be talking about here today. You know, there are a lot of different beliefs about what happens immediately after we die. Atheists believe that when we die, that's it. Turn out the lights, the party's over. Hindus believe in reincarnation, where we keep coming back in one life after another, maybe as an animal or a plant until we reach some level of higher awareness. New Agers believe that we become permanent spirits that float around in the underworld where everything is bright and white. Isn't that nice? Others believe that everyone gets into heaven and that there is no hell, or that we gain entrance to heaven after having a chat with St. Peter at the pearly gates. And some believe that everyone in heaven 
is looking down on us, extremely interested in what's happening in our lives. But with all of these ideas that are dreamt up in the minds of humans, where do we turn for real answers? If we want the true assurance of what happens to us immediately after we die, we find that the Bible teaches a much simpler, satisfying, and secure hope, far better than anything our finite worldly minds can conjure up. It's in God's Word that we see what resting in peace really looks like. You know, the Bible summarizes our life after death into three steps. We die, we rest, and then we rise again. So first of all, at the moment of death, our body and soul are separated. In Luke 23, 46, we read, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. So Jesus' crucified, dead body remained on the cross, but his spirit goes to be with the Father. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 describes the process for you and I. And the dust returns to the ground. Remember, Adam was made from dust. So the dust, our body, returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. At the moment we die, our soul either rests with Jesus if we're Christians or apart from him if we're not. In either case, the soul awaits Christ's second coming. And on that day, when Jesus comes again in glory, our bodies will rise from the dead and be reunited with our souls for judgment day. 1 Corinthians 15, 42-43 says this, it is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. So after Judgment Day, people will live eternally with a physical body, either with the Lord here or Lord in heaven or apart from God in hell. You're going to hear more about this next week from Pastor Keith. So to summarize, we will all die and eventually rise again. But it's the in-between time that makes us wonder a little, doesn't it? Rest in peace, we say, but what does this resting look like? What's happening to our loved ones who have died as we wait for Jesus' second coming? What are they experiencing right now? What is this resting place in heaven really like? Well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that heaven is an actual place, not just a figment of our imagination or some higher state of consciousness to be attained. You know, I remember years ago when my daughter was about 10 years old and she asked me what heaven was like. Well, we had recently been to Disney World, so I asked her if she remembered how amazing it was to be there. You know, I can still remember the look of wonderment on her face when she first saw the Magic Kingdom. So in response to her question, I said, honey, heaven is so much better than Disney World that we can't even imagine it. That's the best I could come up with as a dad at that time. But you know, God tells us in his word that heaven is a real place. As I said, Jesus told his disciples from the upper room the following. He said, my father's house in heaven has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus said, not only is heaven a place, it's a place that he's prepared and will eventually bring us to. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, God's word tells us how Noah, Abraham, and Sarah, you know, heroes of the faith in the Old Testament, knew that they were strangers on earth in search of their, their real or true homeland. Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 reads, Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. 
Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. You see, they knew their true home is in heaven, the city God prepared for them and for us. And what does this city in heaven look like? Look like? Listen to John's inspired words from Revelation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. We could use some of that right now, right? No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You see, heaven is a real location where the Father is presiding and Christ the King of Kings is ruling. Heaven is where the souls of believers in Christ crucified through baptism and God's word are dwelling and doing things right now. Can I get an amen on that? Heaven is real. Second, we learn that our resting place, either with Jesus or apart from him, is where we go immediately after we die. The greatest evidence for this is what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. You heard me read it a few minutes ago. He said, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. He says, don't you fear God? And he said, since you are under the same sentence, <coughs> we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. <coughs> Excuse me. So the repentant criminal has faith that Jesus is who he says he is. He believes. Now remember, these guys are minutes away from dying. And with one of his last breaths, Jesus says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Today. You know, there are some who believe that when you die, your soul is stuck in purgatory, waiting for someone to pay or pray you out. <coughs> or that you experience some type of soul sleep, it's called, where you experience nothing until Jesus comes again. But friends, these views are not supported by scripture. When the thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he had no idea when that might happen. But he wanted Jesus to remember him whenever it did. But Jesus let him know in that moment exactly when it would happen today. He didn't say that it would be after his sins were paid off in purgatory or after he'd taken a nice long soul sleep nap. Rather, he said minutes before they were going to die that the thief would join him in paradise today without delay. In Luke 16, we also read about the rich man and the beggar Lazarus who died. Immediately after they die, the rich man went to Hades or hell and Lazarus went to heaven. Now this is what the rich man experienced in Luke 16. In Hades or hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus the beggar by his side. See, the unbelieving rich man is tormented in hell where he can see the beggar Lazarus hanging out with Abraham his soul being comforted by Father Abraham. The rich man, Lazarus, and Abraham are all awake and conscious and speaking. Because you see, while the body rests when we die, the soul is awake. The truth is, is that when we die, we immediately arrive at a place, either with Christ or apart from him. 
If we have lived a life connected to Christ through faith during this life, we will immediately be connected to him in death. And for those who have rejected Christ and lived apart from him in this life, they will be apart from him in death. When we die as Christians, Jesus will say the same thing to us that he did to the thief on the cross that day. Today, you are with me in paradise. You know, hopefully, knowing that heaven is real and that you will go there immediately to be with Jesus when you die, it gives you great comfort. But maybe you're wondering what you're going to be doing while you rest in anticipation of Jesus' second coming. You know, will there be stuff to do? Will there be activities? Will there be food? Can I play golf while I'm resting? The truth is, friends, I don't know. The Bible tells us a lot about what heaven will be like after Judgment Day, as I read earlier from the book of Revelation. But it doesn't tell us specifically what we'll do while we're resting in peace. However, Jesus does give us some insight about a Christian's entry into eternal life in the parable of the talents. Let me read to you from Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now compare entering into the joy of Jesus with what happens to the unfaithful servant in verse, in verse 30. There we read, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Quite a compare and contrast, isn't it? By the way, weeping and gnashing of teeth was a common first century expression that meant deep, intense regret. It's that feeling when you miss a golden opportunity or you forget to do something that you know was really important to a loved one. It's the feeling that I saw a friend experience when his father died before he could reconcile with him. Which, by the way, to whatever degree you have power over that, don't ever let that happen to yourself. But it's these type of intense regrets, times a thousand for all eternity, that are included in weeping and gnashing of teeth. But God's word tells us that our resting prior to the resurrection will be one where our soul is comforted. Maybe even by Abraham, just like Lazarus the beggar was. Our resting will be filled with joy, with satisfaction and contentment in the presence of the King, the one true God, like never ever before. You know, as mere humans, it's hard for us, if not impossible, for us to really grasp how great it's going to be. We spend a lot of time and effort in this life trying to create our own amazing moments on this earth. But the joy and the contentment of heavenly rest with Jesus will be about being with him, not what we're doing. You know, think of those times when your heart was overfilled with joy. Maybe it's when you first held your newborn child or grandchild. Maybe it's those special times that you've spent with your spouse. Maybe it was when your kids saw the magic kingdom for the first time. Or maybe feeling fully relaxed while walking on a beach at sunset or by looking at a mountain range. You know, I got to tell you, this might seem shallow, but when I stood on the 18th tee box, at Pebble Beach Golf Course, soaking it all in. I thought, Lord, if I die now, I'll be perfectly content, because I don't think it's going to get any better than this. Well, needless to say, I was wrong. Because you see, even our greatest moments on earth pale in comparison to resting in heaven in the presence of Jesus. In this world, we just scratch the surface of God's joy and goodness. But when we get into his presence, we're going to be overwhelmed by it. So we've learned today what the Bible tells us is true about when we die. That our soul goes immediately to be with God 
where we will rest before we rise again at his second coming. And we will rest with him in heaven, a real place where we will be overwhelmed with the presence, joy, and satisfaction of being with our Lord. Knowing that, can we agree that these biblical truths should be a game changer in our lives? I think we should heed what the Apostle Paul's words say. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. Paul says, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul looks forward to his rest with Christ more than anything, but make no doubt about it. While he's still on this earth, he's living for him. He's ready to go home when Jesus calls, but until then, he's all in to serve his king. I think if we listen to Paul's words, we confidently know that when we die, we gain rest in Christ. But while we live, we live boldly for him. Let's close. Heaven is where we rest in peace. It's the eternal home that we long for in the midst of this broken world. You know, the fires that we walk through here only make us more thankful for the glory we'll experience when we get back home in heaven where we belong. On those days when we've hit rock bottom, we're feeling broken with nothing left to give, it's the hope of our heavenly home that keeps us going. So remember, no matter what we have to face in this life, through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus has prepared rest for us as we dwell with him for eternity. So as the sermon video said earlier, what are we afraid of? Let's live and serve the Lord courageously, with abandon, knowing that one day we will rest with him and we will rise again with him in victory. And all God's people said, Amen. Please pray with me. O God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks that by his death he destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Strengthen us in confidence that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come will be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. At this time, we pray the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his perfect peace. Amen. Please join me now in our sending words for today. The thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. 
Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. Knowing that to live is Christ and to die is gain, let us go in peace and serve the Lord. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thank you.